So please watch the PowerPoint here, how to do it, how to put it on, it's called Donnie. So, you know, whenever you're in a pandemic and, and COVID-19 is exemplifying that for all of us, there is going to be a constant need for balance between economic strife and healthcare strife. They are not mutually exclusive, they interplay with each other. It's important for people to be able to work so that they can literally put food on the table for their families. And so we're learning and we're, we're trying to get to that balance. It is not a mistake to lift the order for stay at home. What we need to do, and, it, and the governor did state this, what we need to do is we need to take those other behaviors and make sure that we're doing them exquisitely. It's, it's not just a black and white that we all have to be locked in quarantine or that we all go out and go, go to the bars and go dancing in groups of 500. We're in the middle. And in the middle, when we start to see an increase, there are things that we can do so that we hopefully never have to go all the way back to an extreme quarantine situation. Those things need to happen. We need to try and distance, we need to wear masks, we need to wear them exquisitely. If we get back to doing more of that, we hopefully will not have to go back all the way to what you're asking about. Well, that really is an interesting question. You wear a mask, I wear a mask, my colleagues wear a mask. We have elected leaders of the state who have chosen not to wear a mask. Are they sending the wrong message? I mean, when you have the governor, the head of DPS, the head of the National Guard, and the state health director all coming to press conferences, none wearing a mask, what's the message that that sends? So it is important for us as leaders to lead by example, which is what I'm doing here with you and for you and for the citizens of Arizona today. I'm also attempting to educate you about how you wear a mask appropriately and how you wash your hands. The more of us that do that, the better that message will cascade down to the communities that we serve. And so I appreciate you allowing me to exemplify how that is done correctly. Doctor, if you said if we keep on this trend, we will exceed bed capacity. That is a matter of math, I assume. So do you know the date and when that would happen if we stay on the same trend? Yeah, so the data that I showed, and if I can go back to that just for a second here. So this is data for Banner ICU COVID patients. And so we do have um, capacity with our ventilators, as I stated earlier, and we do have stretch capacity within our ICUs. Um, we often have stretch capacity during influenza season and other things like that. Uh, I don't have a crystal bar ball, and we all know that the modeling around what this pandemic looks like is very difficult because we have not been in COVID-19 pandemic before. What I do know is that if you continue to follow a curve like that, at some point, we will exceed our capacity. I don't know when that will happen. I don't know for sure if that will happen. I am concerned that it might happen and we need to do some things to avoid that from occurring. Everybody who's out there can take specific steps to do so like I've outlined to have an impact so that curve will look different two and three weeks from today. Doctor, if people aren't being personally responsible, if they're not wearing their masks exquisitely over the next couple of weeks, and you see these trends in line, uh, what does the state need to do to turn that trend in the other direction so that we don't get to a critical point for the ICU capacity? Yeah, so we all need to work together in the state of Arizona to create a different trend. And so the public messaging, what I'm doing here with, with all of you and what will get cascaded is so incredibly important. Uh, I know that other healthcare systems will likely have the same, same message. Um, I believe Maricopa County also had some similar messaging this afternoon. Those are the types of messages that we need to do right now so that we don't get to a point two or three weeks down the road where we have to take different or more serious action. We're trying to avoid that from happening because we're, again, attempting to balance economic strife with healthcare strife. If we exceed hospital capacity, different types of interactions will need to be undertaken. Um, those could look similar to what we have done previously. Um, you know, I, I don't know exactly what we'll all do at that point. We're trying to take proactive action right now to avoid that from occurring. That's the best case scenario and why I'm in front of you today. Can you give some examples of what that different action might be? Maybe that will help motivate people to take more personal responsibility right now. What would it look like two to three weeks from now if people don't change their behavior? 
Yeah, so if, if we don't take action right now and hospital capacity starts to be constrained beyond what we're able to stretch to, it looks like things that we have done previously. So it can look like that we might have to go and reduce surgeries again. And that has a significant impact for individuals who are out there that need surgeries for things that are non-COVID related. Those are the types of steps that we might have to do. And I'm imploring everybody to take action now so that we don't have to have that happen. You all have family members who've had surgery. You know what goes into getting ready for a surgery. We want to avoid anybody having to have their necessary surgery be delayed because we've exceeded hospital capacity. Doctor, I'm sure you have concerns about the nightly gatherings of hundreds and their thousands of demonstrators night after night, just here in the Valley alone. Can you just talk about you know, what the potential is for a spike even worse than you might imagine? Yeah, so uh, the, the situation that we all uh, are beginning to understand that's unfolding across the country that have uh, motivated protesters to go out so that they can have their voice heard is certainly um, uh, very impactful. And it is important for individuals to be able to have a voice and, and for that voice to be heard. But as I talked about steps that can be taken to mitigate, I want to reinforce that none of these steps have to be looked at as a complete black step or a white step. And by that, I mean just we're either doing everything or we're doing nothing. So if people are out and about in public, I believe there are ways that they can do that more safely. So try to stay six feet away from somebody. Wear your mask. Wash your hands frequently. And for all of those that are out in the extreme heat right now, it's very hot in Arizona. We've been over 110 degrees. It's important to stay hydrated. We've seen individuals suffering from heat stroke who are out there, um, whether they're protesting or just out in the environment for extreme period of time. And so we implore them also to maintain hydration. So certainly we want everybody's voice to be heard, but some of those steps can still be taken even while you're out there um, protesting and making sure that your voice is heard. Let me, uh, not related questions here. Let me start with uh, maybe more common. Could look like. So um, the question about what happens when a hospital system reaches capacity, there's, there's several tactics that we have been planning for that, that we might need to deploy. So first of all, I, I want to say that um, we, we look to be very collaborative with the other healthcare systems within the region and within the state of Arizona. You've heard us talk about the Arizona surge line, which is an opportunity and ability for us to load balance COVID patients within the state. So things could look like if we um, reached capacity in a certain health system or in a certain region of the state, that patients might need to be transferred to another region of the state. Um, other things I, I spoke about earlier, if we start to reach capacity, we need to do things potentially like reduce our surgery uh, schedules. So those patients that are non-COVID that are waiting for surgeries might have, might have to have their surgeries delayed, similar to what we did previously. In other extreme cases, we might need to look to resources that are even outside of the state of Arizona, um, transfers and, and the like. So there are a number of tactics that we would potentially have to take if we exceeded hospital capacity. We're here today to message, please take steps, take your own ownership of that so that we don't reach that, so we can be here to take care of everybody in the state of Arizona that needs us. And we already are in the stretch period, sorry, in the stretch area, we're already there. Um, today uh, in Banner, in the, in the Maricopa County, which is where most of our hospital beds are, in, in our ICUs, we are getting right up to the 100% capacity and going into stretch. What about PMS? Can I, can I just, I think, um, Yeah, I'm sorry. Can I tell you. Uh, so, so Doctor, tell me uh, uh, a little bit about how your employees are doing mm -hmm. at this point, right? We, we heard from them at the very beginning of the pandemic, they were very concerned about having enough equipment and, and morale seems low. What have you done to kind of shore up that staff for what looks to be a very long and probably worse path than we've gone through so far? Thank you. So, you know, our, um, I'll just, let me just go back if I can to this slide. So as I stated earlier, our EOC has been stood up since March 4th. I begin and close each one of those with a statement here. We're here to save as many lives as we can, and we will only do so by keeping our healthcare workers as safe as possible. So our healthcare workers truly are heroes. Um, they have risen to the occasion. They, they wear PPE, they're doing PPE preservation. 
uh, it's very difficult for them in a, in a pandemic. We're asking everybody to take these steps so that when they're out in your community, that hopefully they won't become ill so that they can continue to come to work and take care of all of you. We've been expressing extreme gratitude to our healthcare workers throughout all of this, and we have a lot of support for them that we have built throughout the pandemic. We've done things like provide childcare, provide meals, uh, we have an SOS fund. The list is actually quite long of what we've done for our healthcare workers who are truly healthcare heroes. Um, they're going to need more in the future, and we know that, and we're working to uh, continually build the resources and the support that we can for the healthcare workers. Each and every one of you that are out there in the community can do your part. Do your part by doing the things that we need you to do. Follow the CDC guidelines and reduce the risk that our healthcare workers will get ill while they're out there in the community. Is, are there um, particular hospitals that are, are harder hit in Maricopa County? That, that, and, and at what point does Banner say, we're not taking any more surgery? So um, there, there are some, there are hospitals within our Banner system that have had more COVID patients than others. So BUNCP has had the most number of COVID patients uh, within our Banner health system to date. With the Arizona Surge Line, that is helping us balance the COVID-19 patients amongst different health systems. Banner underneath that has a transfer service that also can load balance within the Banner hospitals, the COVID-19 patients, as well as other types of patients. We are currently utilizing the transfer service to do that so that other hospitals besides BUMCP are now starting to see more COVID-19 patients. Again, in an effort to make sure that we are balancing the COVID-19 patients throughout so that every hospital can continue to be there for the community and the patients that need that.